good. Well, good evening. This is our first session in the White House Communications course for the spring semester, and um, I'm delighted to have Alexis Simmendinger as our guest. Alexis is a reporter for National Journal, and she covered the White House until uh, recently. She's moved to a broader uh, political uh, beat, but she's covered the White House from the Bush administration uh, through Clinton and uh, then Bush. And uh, as is happening in, in uh, many news organizations, uh, reporters are shifting out of the White House as if it's a <laughs> beat that um, uh, no, one, uh, you know, no one is left in the room because uh, they're out doing uh, other and more interesting things that the, um, that the president is sort of yesterday's post. Um, so Alexis has been, uh, what year did you come to the beat? I started covering the White House uh, with 41 administration, and that full time I really started part time in 1991, and then his election year 1992, which is sort of an aberration because he was gone on the road so much. Uh huh. And um, at, uh, with National Journal, she has covered the presidency in a somewhat different way than uh, than a lot of news organizations cover it, because she's covered the institution of the presidency, not just the president himself. So she looks at how the White House operates. She looks at the product of what the uh, president produces, executive orders, for example. And it's not just a look at uh, what, what is the president doing, what is the president saying. And uh, she also uh, does commentary on Washington Week in Review. And she does commentary for um, a lot of news organizations. You're doing BBC tomorrow, right? right. And you've done them about Super Tuesday. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's, but, um, but uh, I think we probably should be thinking about early in the course is, um, is what it is that news organizations do uh, for our political system. Where do they fit in? And um, uh, what is they're not mentioned in uh, the Constitution, uh, so why are they so important? Okay, good question. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, obviously, the, uh, reporters tend to think of ourselves as absolutely essential to our form of governance. We would like to think of ourselves that way. I don't think the public appreciates us quite that way. And I haven't met a president yet who thinks of us as necessarily essential, maybe a burr under the saddle and something that has to be worked around. But the idea of what we in the uh, news media try to think of ourselves as is um, a way for the public to reckon with the government that they have to take the curiosities and the concerns of the public, transmit that uh, in some public way um, into, into our form of governance. And then, obviously, when we cover the president, the president is using us mm -hmm. every part of the day, every part of his week, to uh, transmit the information that he thinks uh, is so important to success in his administration. For instance, um, I know when I first started uh, being a reporter in Washington, I covered Congress first. And so that's really uh, kind of uh, the, the way that I really understood how government was working was Congress and the actual departments themselves, what was going on. And then I came to covering the White House afterwards. And that was a really, I think, good way for me to understand how Washington worked because you can get the whole picture of how the message circle works. And I came to appreciate what a president was doing much more that way because I had been in all of the different spots paying attention to how the messages were circulating. Uh-huh. And so you saw how they landed on the hill. How they landed on the hill, how, was, uh, how the uh, members uh, representing their constituencies in the House, for instance, very narrow casting in terms of very uh, protected um, uh, congressional districts where they were representing narrow points of view, how they were bringing them into the House, how the Senate was deliberating with what their states were interested in, and then watching how a president had to work with sending a message to Congress and then how Congress was trying to send a message back uh, to their own districts or to the White House and the kind of uh, adversarial relationship that the president feels with uh, members of the media is not necessarily the way that members of Congress feel about members of the media. So it was a very interesting, uh, I thought, um, 
frame of reference to be on both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh -huh. what, um, uh, what do you think accounts for members of Congress being, um, being much more willing to, uh, and eager to talk to Very the press, eager. where the president, uh, the president is not quite so eager? Well, in the case of Congress, what I found and what I think a lot of my colleagues have found is that members live and die in their own uh, states and in their own home districts uh, by the kind of press coverage that they hope to achieve, the kind of recognition that they hope to achieve. And obviously they have many other ways to do it than just the, um, the mainstream media. Uh, and particularly as I've been covering Washington, there are many, many more ways that they can do it through Internet and um, the way they can do emailing, et cetera, to their supporters. But they are so eager to uh, work with the media, especially their hometown or local media, to get uh, some kind of public recognition for what they're doing. I've never met a lawmaker on the Hill who didn't have aspirations for higher office in one form or another, and they feel that the uh, publicity that they receive is so helpful to them in communicating their role in Mm -hmm. um, for instance, the president and members of Congress right now are at loggerheads over something called earmarks, which the president is saying he opposes. And lawmakers of both parties are very um, supportive of earmarks because to them it means that they're bringing home special money to their states and their districts, and they want public recognition for what they're doing, that they got the courthouse named after someone or they got a special appropriation for a particular project in their state. Uh -huh. The president is trying to communicate to the public through the media right now that earmarks are bad, that they're a waste of money, that we need to trim spending by getting rid of these thousands of earmarks in every legislative session through appropriations. And so right there you can see that there are two branches of government that are of very differing points of view, regardless of the Republican ideology mm -hmm. that they would like to spend less. But you can see that uh, lawmakers are pulling us aside as members of the media and saying, look, you know, give me some publicity for what I'm doing, for the bridge or the courthouse or the special uh, grant program that I'm getting for the hospital in my state, whatever. And the president is saying, no, no, those are all bad. What is the, the difference in the way they communicate? Well, in, in uh, the way that, uh, how, many member, how many of the uh, class have ever seen Senator Schumer of New York? Raise your hands. Now, why do you think, you, you all are in Maryland, why do you think you've seen Senator Schumer from New York? Why would you recognize him? What does he do a lot of? He, he looks for the television cameras, right? What, one of the things is that there are certain members that are just absolutely, their reputations are um, for being complete uh, television hogs or publicity hogs. So one of the things they do is try to promote themselves and their points of view. They try to obviously get um, roles in Congress that give them a chance to go on the talk shows and talk and, and uh, sort of, uh, they're not always very good at modulating how they work with the media. Uh, they're very eager for publicity in all forms. Uh, the president is much more interested in dictating um, how a story should be done or how the coverage should go, whereas uh, my experience with lawmakers has been that they're very responsive to the kind of uh, curiosities or concerns or interests that we in the media have and uh, uh, try to make themselves slightly more accessible to the sorts of stories that the media may dream up or think that they need to do because they can't be quite so choosy about the coverage. The president, in my experience, and this president in particular, is the most uh, controlling in the way he wants his message to be received, um, the kind of information he wants to give out, um, when he wants to give it out, um, and that may be in part because of the way that Republican presidents tend to think about government and their, their uh, role in government, that they have a very limited idea of how their communication should go and that it should be top down. My experience from covering the Clinton White House is that they were very interested in government, they were not necessarily as disciplined about the me message, and so we were a little bit more able in the Clinton years to tell them the kind of story we wanted to do, and they would be responsive to us. But my experience with President Bush is that um, the last thing they're interested in necessarily is being responsive uh, in all cases to the stories that we think need to be covered. Is that in part um, Bush's own view? One thing that struck me on his recent uh, trip um, to the Middle East, 
he was um, he was in the desert and he was in a, a setting where he was answering some questions from reporters and there was a falcon there he had a falcon there who was flapping his wings and uh, he said uh, falcon's nervous yeah. um, he is not used to having a press conference right and it's, there have been a lot of those kinds of things that are pretty telltale about his uh, his view of the press right um, do do people in uh, the White House think of the press as um, as a surrogate for the public? Well, President Bush's attitude is that he knows that we tend to think of ourselves in the media as a surrogate for the public, and he finds that objectionable, uh, and has actually challenged that. Or and he and members of his team have sort of challenged that, like who gave you that right to be the surrogate for the public, and. President Bush has been much more interested, uh, and he has, maybe this is the kind of communications technique that uh, tends to be driven by campaigning, where he um, believes that he can control his message and that he can di speak directly to the public, that the president can go over our heads and speak directly to them. Um, Professor Kumar has written a lot about presidential press conferences, and this happens to be a president who is actually very good at press conferences from his perspective in terms of dictating to us a certain kind of information and controlling what he says and not making news sort of outside of his own terms. He's actually yeah. very good at it, but he hates doing them or has resisted doing them as much as um, maybe some of his predecessors. And partially that's because he thinks that's something that we're demanding of him, that we're calling him to account, that we're going to be dictating questions that he needs to answer, and that he wants it to fit into his own communication strategy. And you can see that when he does them. I know um, uh, Professor Kumar has had uh, Helen Thomas from UPI and Hearst come and speak. Uh, in the past, I know Helen has talked about how press conferences are so useful because they're the only venue that we have in the media and the public has to make a president stand up and answer any and all questions that can be thrown at him in some given period of time. And he has to respond. He has to answer some question without preparation, yeah. without a net in front of him, uh, and be responsive to the public. And that's why Helen has, for years, decades, found them really valuable. President Bush has pr kind of made them less valuable because he's figured out how to answer all those questions on his own terms, and he's become quite adept at that. Um, and using other venues. And using other venues, yeah. absolutely. Um, President Bush followed in the footsteps of President Clinton by trying to use uh, what we call, or what Professor Kumar has called, joint news conferences, where there's a, uh, a another head of state who's visiting him, and they take two questions each side, and you get a chance to look like you're in charge of foreign policy, and you're uh, being responsive in a very limited fashion. The president does, uh, President Bush does uh, these short opportunities, these photo ops in the mm -hmm. cabinet room or in the Oval Office, where uh, they actually pre-cook who's going to get to ask the questions. They cannot dictate what questions they're going to get, but they know that the wires are going to be throwing yeah. questions of the minute from the news cycle of that day at the president. He's very well prepared. Um, they don't like to have, uh, uh, this is ancient history to this class, but President Reagan used to get questions thrown at him uh, from the press corps. I mean, literally shouted at him, and Sam Donaldson was famous for this because he has this big, booming voice. And President Reagan uh, learned, his staff learned to turn the helicopter engines up when he was getting ready to leave the South Lawn so that President Reagan could pretend he didn't hear a thing from the crowd, <laughs> just this little voice <coughs> coming at him. This particular president absolutely hates having anything shouted at him in any form or fashion. He finds that incredibly rude and untidy. President Clinton was um, perfect to throw bait at um, as, as Professor Kumar knows from uh, things that we've witnessed together in the Rose Garden or elsewhere, where a reporter yeah. could actually throw a topic yeah. sentence at him or a subject at President Clinton, and it was like um, fly fishing. It was like finding the hook right into President Clinton's ego or his anger or whatever it was that would get him dialed up that day. And he would spin around and answer the question in whatever yeah. form he thought it needed to be added, much to his staff's distress. But President Bush is very disciplined. Yeah. One day um, he was doing a um, an event on the South Lawn, and it was during the 
uh, during his reelection campaign, and they had a mock-up of a house, and it was uh, about um, middle-income housing for um, young homeowners, and um, Bill Plant uh, From CBS? of CBS yelled a, a question at him about when was he going to get a house. And because and what he wanted was just that was throwing some bait and Clinton could not pass that up. No. And he said that he liked the one he had and he planned on staying just <laughs> where he was. Exactly. <laughs> Whether it was public housing right. uh, or not. Exactly. That he liked it. And now you know the class may be thinking, well, what is that? Is that a game that the press plays? Because President Bush thinks that we sometimes like to play gotcha. Um, and that we sometimes will do that just to sort of move a story of our own and it's really not important to the American people. And in some cases he's absolutely right. But in other cases he's absolutely wrong about that because I think in all of those situations you can learn something about your president and you can also transmit part of a message to a president. Uh, and you can learn a lot about the exchange. I mean, you can learn something about the way the president is thinking is he anxious about something? Does he know that he's on the ropes about a particular topic? Does he know some policy or uh, exchange that he's having with Congress is not going well? And then you can also, uh, I think he can, uh, to whatever extent he disagrees that we're surrogates for the public, he can certainly get a sense of how the uh, opinion elites, which is sort of the way President Bush thinks of us here in Washington, the Washington press corps, he can get a sense of what's on that sort of, what's on the minds of that milieu. And um, to whatever extent he may think of it as petty, I think real business can be done in those sorts of exchanges. And uh, really effective presidents have also learned at times how to use those moments to have the last word in an effective way. Um, I was thinking of President Clinton um, during impeachment, he tried to kind of go underground and disappear and only deal with very structured, controlled events so that he wouldn't have to deal with the, the, the uh, baited questions. But every now and then, he could get the better of that uh, situation by <coughs> trying to <coughs> convey, uh, <laughs> over our honking professor, yeah. to, to convey uh, to the public that he was doing the work of the people. And his uh, job approval numbers actually went up at the end of his administration during impeachment and partially that was because he was able to convey effectively that the kinds of questions that we were throwing at him about Monica and impeachment were not necessarily uh, representing the point of view of the American public and he absolutely made that case effectively and it really helped him. It helped him govern, it helped him show Congress that that uh, whole exchange needed to be shut down and he was able to do that. He was acquitted obviously even though he was impeached he was acquitted and he moved on to leave office at a very high point in uh, public appreciation for his presidency and what was going on. President Bush is not going to be able to do that as he limps out of office. And I'm not saying that those exchanges necessarily would help him, but I think if, if President Bush had spent more time uh, possibly being more open and transparent, haha. -ha, uh, since he's one of the most secretive presidents, uh, certainly the most secretive I've ever covered, but if he and, and Vice President Cheney had been slightly more open, I think it would have accrued to their benefit because I think President Bush can answer all these questions. I think he has an understanding by this point in his presidency of what he's doing and what his mission is, and he could try to answer, I think, more effectively, certainly more substantively, some of the policy that he's tried to pursue. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it seems that that's not how he sees his job. Uh, you remember when um, Tony Snow uh, took over as press secretary, and the president, um, in introducing him, said, I'm the decider and he is the explainer. Right. And which is a, uh, is a different role. Yes, the press secretary explains, but the president explains as well. In uh, Clinton's case, Clinton um, explained on policy. He certainly didn't like explaining. Uh, his personal life, but um, uh, he never would pass up a chance to explain, explain policy, uh, policy exactly. and how it operated. Exactly. Yeah. Um, President Bush just has an idea, um, as we've seen some of this discussion in the presidential debates, actually, about his role as a, a kind of a business executive style training, his MBA. Um, uh, Senator Clinton made mention of this effectively in the debate that she just recently had with Senator Obama.
that President Bush thinks of himself as the first MBA CEO kind of president. And she was saying that very derisively, but President Bush actually uh, championed that idea when he came into office, that he was a person who understood how to delegate, that he was not going to get into micromanaging. He wasn't going to be like President Clinton or President Carter, sort of caught up in the minutia. He wanted to be decisive. Uh, he wanted to have uh, a narrowed field of information presented to him uh, that was at a high enough level where what they needed from him was a decision, not necessarily to be caught in endless meetings, which was uh, something that he felt that President Clinton and his administration had gotten too caught up in, that President Clinton never saw an issue uh, too small for him to weigh in on. And, um, and that was possibly very true in the beginning of President Clinton's administration, and maybe it was true all the way to the end, but that was because they just had a very different perspective on what presidents should be involved in and what they should do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can debate. Uh, we will continue to debate right through as we're watching this presidential um, race continue what role we want in the next president. And all presidents are, are the elections are uh, referendums on the one that we have and the one that we're getting rid of. And you can see from the vigorous debate that's happening right now in the campaign that we're debating uh, some of the stylistic points um, almost more than we are the deep weed kind of substance of the policy. Uh -huh. So in a way, he, he views the, um, the media as, as kind of in two parts. He views it as a vehicle, and he views it as a vehicle that he can use to get to the public. I, I definitely think that, my, in my experience, that President Bush sees it as something that he needs to use, that, yeah. that we are a uh, fact of life that uh, is not always constructive in our form of democracy that he needs to use and sort of ch to, to best. He thinks of it as a competition in which we're adversaries yeah. and he needs to best his adversary, get the better of us. One of the other things that I've noticed, President Bush has, uh, has a sophisticated understanding, I think, of some of the challenges that the mainstream media are undergoing right now in terms of the contraction of our readership, the difficulties that we're having on the business side, how people like in this class don't have time or interest in reading anymore. And so he understands that, that while we in the mainstream media believe that we're representing the public, uh -huh. that the public is turning to us less. And President Bush has delighted in that fact. He, uh -huh. has, he brings that up, that he understands that's happening and that the ground is shifting under us, that the audience is, is shrinking in some ways and enlarging in others. And so he's tried to exploit that. Um, he learned that, I think, in his campaign um, in uh, 1999 and 2000, and he, uh -huh. he's definitely exploited that in his reelection. And uh, I think he would have some very sophisticated thoughts for whoever succeeds him on how they can do it. Um, but in, in the end, you know, even if you're getting your news from, uh, say, people are getting their news from uh, the Internet, there are some uh, basic sources that they're getting that information from. So, for example, the wire services have been doing very well with the Internet. Um, because they're on, like, uh, AP is uh, on AOL, and um, uh, so it is uh, ubiquitous, right. really, around the world. So that, you know, you can think you don't have to deal with uh, Terry Hunt, that he's, uh, you know, he's kind of uh, yesterday. Right. But, it, but in fact, he isn't at all. Well, how and many people in this class uh, watch John Stewart? Right. What's that? Right. A lot That's of people. people. And, and oh. not that you get the news from that, but kind of at the end of the day, how many of you think that that sort of encapsulates, summarizes kind of the major news of the day? Does it help you kind of get a drift of what's been going on politically in the news cycle? Yes or no? Raise your hands. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> sort of. Sort of? Okay. What, well, the reason I'm bringing it up is because for Comedy Central or Jon Stewart or Colbert Report, where do you think that they get their information to use in a, in a comedic way or, a, or an ironic way or a witty way? They get it from the wire services or from the mainstream media. That's where they get it, the television, whatever. So to the extent to which you're 
impression of what's happened in a day or from a particular candidate or the president is formed <coughs> by that, to some extent the ground, the foundation of what those talented people have used is the same mainstream media that President Bush is trying to get over. So all I'm trying to say is it's a little bit inescapable still. Right. Still. That's all. That's still. That's yeah. just my point. How does anybody have anything that you think about that in terms of the effectiveness of, of of the president's message out of the White House, new forms of media? <coughs> no. How many of you all okay. read the New York Times or the Washington Post online? And uh, would that be every day that you read it? Yes? Well, once in a while. Yeah. So that's almost everybody, right? <laughs> okay. That's, I'm just interested in kind of where, where the foundation of the information still comes from. Yeah. It's not just bloggers. It's not just people <coughs> who are, who are uh, opinion commentators, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, when in looking at, um, at uh, Bush and his view of the media, um, so one way is looking at them as a vehicle and how you're going to use them to get your message, you know, how you're going to get your, your Oval Office speech or what else uh, out. And the other is looking at the press as a pressure. Yeah. And, um, and I think he very much looks at it that way. Is that it, and uh, I think his father did as well, as a source of pressure, always asking for press conferences and whatnot. And uh, he recognizing that they have to do it, but they see those two parts of uh, of the media. Well, when you're um, you're thinking of yourself as representing the public, how do you find out what the public thinks? Well, that's a really good question because I don't think we always have very effective ways to do that. Because one of the things that I'll be really candid about is that we oftentimes in the um, media, and I'm not in broadcast, but I know this is true in broadcast, is that oftentimes we are thinking not only of what we think, quote unquote, the public, and what is that? I mean, as if that's monolithic, the public wants to know, but also we're playing to our bureau chief or our editor. What do we think our editor wants? What do, what do we think our readership wants? So I pay more attention because of the news organization I write for, National Journal, um, to what I think our readership is interested in. And that oftentimes is very hard to fathom because our circulation size is relatively small. It's opinion elites, mostly in the Washington area, people who have a very sophisticated array of other news organizations. They're consulting and news outlets. Uh, and they have a very in-depth understanding of wh how Washington has worked, is working, will work in the future. Uh, so, you know, we don't always get feedback to what we're writing and so it is not a very scientific process to figure out a what does my readership want uh, B what does my editor want or my editors want and then e more broadly kind of what in general does the public need to know about a particular topic and then the other overlay is because I covered the beat for a long time a relatively unusual long time for a White House reporter these days. Um, I also sifted through uh, to some extent what I thought needed to be written about or you know that's my own subjective idea of having covered a beat for a long period of time and that's a, a positive and a negative because you can get fresh eyes to a beat and you'll have a really fresh new approach to something oftentimes a kind of a gee whiz approach as if they don't know what's gone before and then sometimes you'll have a jaded point of view, like I've written about the budget cycle a hundred million times. I just can't go through another budget cycle. So uh, there, the answer to your question is that it's not a very scientific, sophisticated idea of how you put your finger to the wind and figure out exactly what to write about or what's important to write about. Um, in my case with President Bush, one of the first things I, I tried to write about is what made him distinctive, not just what it was that he told me was distinctive about his administration. Uh, for instance, he came into office saying that he was going to have the most ethical administration or that he was going to have um, the most uh, um, 
well, he wanted to be a, uh, a kind of a compassionate conservative, so he would reach out across the aisle. It wasn't always the benchmarks that he set for himself, but also what I noticed that he was doing, for instance, it didn't take very long to realize that even before 9-11, he was setting up a very strong executive power branch and a very closed, not very transparent idea about communicating and information dissemination, not just in the White House, but the entire executive branch, how they were dealing with the departments communicating, what they were doing with their websites. Uh, and that became more pronounced after 9-11, but that was not the catalyst for it. So, you know, for somebody like me who cared a lot about how the White House, the presidency operates, how they organize, how they deal with the entire executive branch, how they reach out to Congress. That to me was fascinating and we tried to do stories right away, I and my colleagues about, at National Journal, about how the president was interpreting his executive powers, how he was challenging them. Uh, this is going to seem like ancient history now, but does anybody remember uh, President Bush got into a tussle about his energy task force in 2001 and 2002. Does anybody remember that? Well, if you get a chance, it's like ancient history now, but um, <coughs> he was holding um, meetings with uh, the oil and gas communities, the energy communities, to formulate right away a quick approach to having an energy policy. And we all know he came from Texas. He had lots of ties to the oil and gas business. And he was challenged right away by the environmental groups and the consumer uh, advocacy groups that his meetings w uh, that he tasked Vice President Cheney to be hosting were closed. And that resulted in a challenge uh, that was supported to some extent by a branch of the government through Congress, David Walker of the, um, of the uh, Government Accountability Office. And that that challenge failed in uh, the courts because they said that GAO did not have standing. But that was fascinating because the president was willing to tell Congress, no, those meetings needed to be closed. We were meeting with our supporters and uh, those that we support in the business community, and we're not going to let you know. And that was one of the first, I think, one of the first instances where we could really see that the president was willing to go to court to support his interpretation of how strong the executive branch could be and should be to consult uh, widely or narrowly, depending on how he viewed it, to establish policy. And um, those were the kinds of stories that we started to do right away. He used, obviously, executive orders, as all presidents do in the beginning, to reinterpret what the president had done uh, before him. And in that case, it was President Clinton. Does anybody remember that he got into, President Bush got into trouble over President Clinton's executive order over how much arsenic is allowed to be in public drinking water? Um, and that's ancient history, too. But President Bush marched into office thinking, I'm just going to take a big old eraser and get rid of every one of President Clinton's executive orders, and I'm going to put in my own. And that was sort of because President Bush came into office with a lot of uh, aides who were not disposed towards sort of pro-environmental thinking. And they immediately ran into a problem because Democrats and uh, Congress, uh, members of Congress have their own constituency groups in the environmental uh, establishment and in the media, and right away they ran into a PR buzzsaw in which it made it look like President Bush wanted to put more arsenic and basically poison us all with our public drinking water. And what ended up happening is that they uh, couldn't get ahead of that news cycle, of that news story, and they ended up going back to President Clinton's executive order and considering it basically like a, a baseball diamond, you know, just a really safe zone. Let's just keep his executive order and get out of this story cycle. So they, they learned a few things about uh, publicity in that initial go-round and what the limits are of being able to say that you're new and different and that you're going to undo everything that President Clinton did before. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> God, we're going to have to give her uh, uh. oxygen in a minute. <laughs> um, how do you get information uh, from a White House? And say, in this case, uh, in the stories that you were doing um, on the presidency, he 
they certainly were not interested in, um, in participating. So right. where, where do you get information? That has evolved over time, and, and my experience in covering an administration, especially a two-term president, is that evolves over time. So in the beginning, yeah. uh, there's a kind of an out, a slight uh, gentle outreach to the media to try to, uh, as a, a White House and, a, and an executive branch starts to mature, there's a little bit of an outreach in which they indulge our desire to do stories, especially process stories. They hate process stories. Most presidents hate them. It's sort of how does this decision get made and who weighed in with X, Y, and Z. Uh, they start off friendly enough and then they immediately begin to clamp down and they try to become more disciplined. But it, all the while, uh, White House correspondents are trying to build their sources. And uh, a good colleague of mine with Fox News, now keep in mind Fox News is considered more disposed or friendly towards Republicans, but I remember him telling me that if he depended on the White House uh, to be his sources for covering the president, he would be fired. And so what he was trying to, to explain was that his experience with Fox News was the same as mine with National Journal, which is that we have to build our sources story by story in a broad network in Washington. Members of Congress, uh, we need to use all the advocacy groups, the special lobbying groups. Anybody who touches the White House can become a potential source for us. And uh, one of the things that we then find as we tiptoe into a second term and especially now in the final year, is that uh, things start looking up for coverage because uh, presidents aren't able to keep that lockdown control over their message uh, at the same heightened level through all eight years. And so gradually it begins to erode and the leaks begin coming uh, in the second term more briskly than they were in the first term because all those interest groups, members of Congress, those professionals who are still working for the president in the departments and the agencies, they all begin to have second thoughts about how things are going, and they're all self-preservationists. And so we have better luck at, get, at getting them to give us bits and pieces of a story, to build a story. There isn't ever just one source who will tell you the whole story about how a president is doing something, but we have much better look, luck at stitching together the fabric of how a particular uh, event or story or trend is going and uh, it becomes more fun to be a reporter in a second term covering a White House in some ways because you can get a much more multi-dimensional picture of what's going on and how decisions are made. Um, for instance, I'll give you just an example from a story that I did. Uh, I uh, wrote about how the um, uh, the president and his staff aides were using uh, Republican National Committee emails to kind of get around and communicate among one another. And the way that I was able to write about that story was because I had built sources inside the White House over some a number of years working on different stories and had kind of heard bits and pieces of how they communicated among one another but I didn't actually put it together into how important that was during the U.S. attorney firings until I remembered how it was that they communicated with one another on a lot of other issues. And one of my sources was very uh, wary about what had happened, as much as a loyalist as this source was to President Bush, was very leery about how political the White House had become. Um, and when I say political, how partisan their thinking had been to the extent that it was actually injuring, uh, this person thought, the president's agenda or opportunities to get things done. And so this person was willing to talk to me about a way that they were all communicating because, um, not because this person was thinking that this needed to be, uh, an end needed to be put to this, but because this person thought that it was worth describing. Um, ha this source had a very sophisticated understanding of what would happen to that information, that Congress would make use of that information, but um, there was kind of a mixed feeling that this, uh, w this particular source that I'm thinking of was willing to confirm some information and describe things. So that's what happens in a second term because they, they lose that starry-eyed idealism that they had.
in the in the first term or maybe right after re-election where they think that everything is going to go great for them and that every decision that a president makes or his staff makes is 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 helpful to even their own partisan agendas uh -huh. um, in the case of uh, aides who um, uh, who who talk uh, does the White House try to find out who the people are Sometimes I have heard of cases of that happening, and I'll give you an example of that that's uh, very old now, but there was a case in President Bush's administration, the first President Bush, of information that was leaking out. Uh, there, it's often the case in an administration, it's true of this president, it's true of every president, that they don't all work in lockstep even among their departments. So, for instance, in President Bush's case, in uh, 41's case, his own EPA was considered a kind of an enemy of his uh, own West Wing. Um, and in this case, something had leaked out to, uh, from inside the Bush 41 White House to try to hurt his own EPA uh, administrator. And, um, and they were eager in, to try to find out how that leaked. And in another case, there was some budget documents that leaked out in 41's administration. And, uh, president Bush 41 was very, uh, just hated leaks, all presidents ha hate them, but actually had tried to engineer a system to figure out how the document leaked out, and he ended up discovering it was his own budget director, Dick Darman, who just recently died, who was the leaker of this information to the media, and he had threatened to fire, and he had threatened to do all these things if, if he found out who it was. And in the end, he did not fire Dick Darman. He had not expected that it would be his own OMB director who had done the <laughs> leaking, but that, that ended up being the case. It's, all, it's often very difficult to figure out, if you're president, exactly to trace it back. Um, in the Kennedy administration, it's tough. Um, Kennedy was upset about something that came out that uh, I think it dealt with uh, the Defense Department. And um, he was angry about it, and he asked uh, Pierre Salinger to track down the leak. And so Salinger did, and he came to him and he said that he's figured out where the leak was. And so he told the leak it was the president himself. Right. And that he had been talking to, uh, to reporters. And, and that's a good example of another. a president, President Kennedy, who actually had very good, close relationships with. Uh, major figures in the media and used them, he exploited them quite adroitly in, in a, a different era, definitely, mm -hmm. of coverage. Yeah. Um, what do you think about, you know, thinking back to other periods and people think of them as maybe um, better times in the relationship between, um, between, at least with the White House and, uh, and the press? Um, what do you think about um, about the relationship and how you've seen it over time, and um, uh, in your ability to uh, to get to get information out, is um, is it as good now? Is it um, uh, as it was? You know, maybe as things were, or as the relationship was, um, say in Kennedy's time. Well, I wouldn't, uh, you know, this is a, a very artificial thing to say because, of course, you can't practically do this. But I wouldn't want to trade places with the reporters who covered President Kennedy and, cha and exchange that time for this time because I think presidents, uh, just in general, well, let's put Bush aside, his efforts to be much more closed and, and secretive. But I still think President Bush is forced to be more open in some ways mm -hmm. than President Kennedy was in those days. And there are lots of reasons why I think that's true. For one thing, there are many more outlets, news organizations with lots of specialty interests that are clamoring at the White House now. And that technology in the news cycle means it's 24 hours a day. And, the, and that the presidents have tried to augment their press and communications operations to try to address that. There's also many more women uh, many more people with different backgrounds uh, who are part of the media organization now or the press corps covering a president uh -huh. than was true in the past. Um, there was a good old boy, and I mean that literally, a good old boy network that was willing to keep President Kennedy's secrets, for instance, in that time or President Roosevelt's confidentialities in order in an exchange, a barter exchange. It was an elite group of people, small, closed circle, that were willing to protect everything from President Roosevelt's 
health or personal life to um, war secrets during uh, World War II. Um, and I think President Bush just couldn't get away with that, and the next president won't be able to get away with that either. Uh -huh. It's just a yeah. natural migration of what we've experienced as a country through war and Watergate and Vietnam and, and the new news cycle and blogging and, and just an exchange of information that happens almost by the second and that a president needs to be more open because uh, either that's very helpful to the story he wants to tell or it's going to be very helpful to the kind of story he needs to beat down. And that often uh, has been the case in my experience covering um, White House is that you see that presidents have to play defense and they have to do that through their communications. I think President George W. Bush came into office thinking that he was going to be very effective at playing offense with his mm -hmm. message and his communications and he did. He was very uh, able to get through No Child Left Behind or his tax cuts or uh, his legislative agenda in the very beginning but then he also realized that after 9-11 he needed to play both. He needed to play more defense and offense, and he tried to figure out how to do that more. Uh, in his case, though, he also was able to exploit the willingness uh, of the American public to, under, to, to, to agree with him that we needed a democracy that was somewhat more closed and secretive in order to protect the country, and he exploited that. And I think the next president is not... Um, may may think that they uh, can do some of that, but it is going to be harder for them to do that, I mm -hmm. think. Do you think that, um, that the Internet, too, makes a difference as far as the amount of information there is on, on um, a White House and, and also about government itself, no matter what they try to uh, keep down, that um, somehow... Things, things circulate. That's right. And well, and, and things circulate that, that they don't, uh, that presidents um, are not actually very eager to see circulate, that's for sure. But, in the, uh, but to another extreme, the pre President Bush has been so wary about some of the things that circulate on the Internet that he was w uh, willing to reclassify certain kinds of information, that he was willing to take down information off of websites uh, in executive branch departments and agencies. Uh, under uh, that he was willing to change the disposition of the Freedom of Information Act to deny requesters information mm -hmm. rather than to uh, have a blanket policy of approval until we uh, can recognize some reason to say no. His attitude, his directive through his chief of staff and his attorney general and his White House mm -hmm. counsel was deny until we uh, recognize a reason to actually say yes, make people go to court to get the information. And that, that is a completely different perspective that um, the president either believed was born of 9-11 or he exploited the fear and the concern that the public had about um, the Internet as a vehicle for entering into our uh, democracy and, and coming into our communities and finding out about our ports and our chemical plants and uh, what our... Um, bridges look like and you know President Bush was pretty effective at exploiting those fears. Uh -huh. There's a, an article today in the Times about uh, spy, t uh, by s spy satellite trackers exactly, and, uh, and how they're around the world tracking particular, particular satellites and what their movements are Right. and so no matter what you try to do um, they had a particular guy in Canada who is, uh, is very good at, um, at tracking them and they really can't shut it down. Right, uh, but so th this administration was eager to try to ask some of the sophisticated um, commercial uh, companies that use satellite mapping to do global mapping. Um, right after the Afghanistan and Iraq wars uh, began to pull some of that mapping down to actually um, make that what was made commercially available to anyone who wanted to pay or for free to look at some of that mapping, the administration stepped in and said, uh, no, we, you know, because of national security, we want you to uh, not make the, that mapping capacity available to everyone to see. Uh, obviously, we now know that the president and the administration were very effective at going to the telecommunications companies and saying, because of national security, we want you to allow us to basically eavesdrop on that traffic that's going back and forth 
uh, for national security reasons and not make that available commercially to anyone else or to other companies, that, you know, or mm -hmm. to other countries. And uh, the president got acquiescence for that. And that debate is continuing right now in Congress in terms of uh, a particular piece of legislation that the president wants to give immunity to those companies for doing what they did, and that's being debated in the Senate right now. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in the period of time that you've reported, can you tell us about the, the difference in, uh, in the world of news of, um, in terms of uh, the growth of the Internet, uh, oh. the growth of cable television, and what difference it's made uh, to you in your reporting of how you get information well, and then how you provide it? I think it's. I think some of the same things that we in the media have experienced are some of the th same things that the White House has experienced in terms of information overload. I mean, we can have a lot of heat, not a lot of light, um, in terms of the the actual traffic of information that you feel somehow that you're supposed to be monitoring, versus your understanding of what's right. going on. Yeah. Those two things are completely different, and I notice in some of the work that Professor Kumar has done and the interviewing that she's done, which is so insightful for reporters like me to hear uh, officials and aides of the president or in the executive branch who struggle with this just the way we yeah. struggle with this, is where do they go to have a sophisticated understanding? And sometimes their understanding is as crude as turning on CNN, just the same as ours is when something is happening very fast. And so I have found in the time that I've covered the presidency that uh, information flows so much faster and there's so much more of it, and yet my understanding of something may not actually be heightened. And I struggled, just like all the reporters that I know, to figure out how to sift through the information that we're getting. What are reliable sources of information? Where can I go to tap that information swiftly? Uh, what... Um, where should I go for not just up to the minute, but also very good, sophisticated analysis? So it's kind of feast and famine. And the feast is there's so much more you can go to. And I'll give you an example from something that you as students can um, uh, maybe don't appreciate enough, but you certainly experience. When I was a student uh, like you, and I don't think of myself as that old, but clearly it's changed so fast. I could not see an international newspaper or a newspaper from around the country without going to the library at my university or my college and uh, going to the actual racks and seeing a physical paper form of the newspaper, which if it came from around the world or from another part of the country might be three days old or several weeks old. And if I wanted to look at some version of that newspaper that happened in the past, I had to go to a book called The um, Index to Periodical Literature, and it was a green bound book that was always out of date, and I'd have to look up by topic, and it would tell me what newspaper or magazine may have done a story on that, and then I had to go to something called microfiche, or even m these kind of reels of yeah, microfilm, uh, microfilm. Yeah. and I'd have to go to a machine, and I'd have to reel it in, and I'd have to turn the reel until I could find that page that would be then displayed up on a screen, and then I'd have to have a dime, and then I'd have to put the dime in the machine, and if I was lucky, the copier would work. And a whole week had gone by between the time I thought I wanted to look at something and the time I actually saw the copy of it to see if that was actually going to be helpful. I can now do that, just like all of you, in a matter of seconds. And I can be around the world. I can read international newspapers in real time. I can see so much information. And that is such a gift. It is really, truly a gift. Or I can watch for myself. I used to have to uh, struggle to uh, maybe get a transcript of someone's commentary in real time, someone speaking on television about something. And now I don't even have to go to a transcript. I can go click and I can see that video for myself. I can see the body language. I can see the intonation. I can see what was the real question that person was asked. That really uh -huh. helps me as a reporter because it's just as important to me to see how a president was asked a question and his body language and his expressions as it was just to see the transcript. So that's all really helpful. But you can get really incredibly distracted by that and not actually uh, come to grips with what 
uh, really is important as opposed to what may seem trendy or of the minute. Um, for instance, I write for a weekly, a weekly news magazine that's nonpartisan. That is like a dinosaur. And if I'm standing at the same event with wire reporters, they're asking about something that has happened that minute or that hour, and they want the president to react to something, to react. I'm much more interested in seeing if I could ask a question and get the president to reflect on something, to actually pull threads of information together to synthesize information in front of me and give me some idea um, collectively about some trend or information or something that will hold up as a thought process. And that is very, very difficult to do in today's news cycle. It is very difficult to even get the White House to recognize why that might be important for a president to do. Because uh -huh. we have a president right now who, uh, as he likes to say, doesn't like to be put on the couch. He does not like to be introspective, to spend a lot of time navel-gazing about the beginning, the middle, and the end of his presidency, or how he's learning, or why uh, for instance, Social Security didn't work for him, or why? where is immigration reform going to go? What is he going to be turning over to the next president about uh, war? And what has he learned about his communication about war that's going to be important to the next president? All of those things, to me, would be fascinating. But, you know, it'll be a cold day in hell before I get George W. Bush to sit down and do that, because... That's just not what he thinks he can do or should do, maybe, or even has the time to do. Yeah, I don't think it's the kind of thing he's interested in doing it's at all. It's just he's not interested. Yeah, uh, he likes thinking forward and not backward, not looking backward. And White Houses generally, I think, are set up that way, that they don't go back and say, okay, what, what did we do well? What's running off the rail here? As occasionally, presidents will have a person or persons who are just accidentally good at synthesizing information or thinking about the past as a way to think about the future. And they'll sometimes task them or trust them to help synthesize that information, to help them lead, mm -hmm. uh, to help them lead in public opinion or help them lead in policy or help them lead their way out of a problem or help them lead uh, effectively on how they'll deal with their legislative relations. In other words, how can we understand what this particular senator or this particular majority leader or, or what's happened in the past uh, with Congress that will help us frame our debate and get legislation through? That's a good practical application. But oftentimes, presidents don't spend enough time thinking about how the past can lead them into the future and effectively lead them. How you can avoid the pitfalls, uh, the mistakes um, that other presidents have made and triumph um, and, and actually succeed. And, and they don't do it enough. And I think it's probably just because you, of what you're saying. They're politicians at heart. They always think it's about the future. They tend to think that everything about their time or their leadership is unique. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because you wonder internally what happened after we right. went into Iraq and didn't find weapons of right. mass destruction. Was that a time when uh, people in the White House uh, did any soul searching about uh, the whole process, right. information process? The one caveat to that that I think has been fascinating to me and it's still unresolved for me is that we have a current president who's the son of a president and President George W. Bush came into office both loving and revering his father and also saying that he was not going to have a presidency that followed in his father's footsteps. To some extent, he wanted to, to uh, rebuke some of the things that his father had been faulted for. Um, and I think that's, that that was George W. Bush looking at the past. He looked at President Clinton and said, I'm not going to be like President Clinton. I want to be the anti-Clinton. And yet here he is in his last year uh, realizing that because he can't do big things anymore, he's going to do some of the things that he rebuked President Clinton for, which is sort of micro-initiatives or finding small policies that tell a bigger story. Like school uniforms. Like, well, he, he hated President Bush for doing s things that he <coughs> thought were small ball. Um, school uniforms or midnight basketball or any of the small um, law enforcement initiatives that President Clinton uh, favored that sort of translated yeah. to the populace that he, as president, was paying attention to what was going on on their city block. 
Yeah. Uh, president Bush said, no way, I'm going to be the transformation president, the transformative president. We're going to overhaul big, big problems. And uh, he, his presidency has just not turned out to be successful on that level, uh, or maybe not even sustaining itself as successful on that level. Uh, maybe he will be able to sustain his tax cuts. Maybe he will be able to have achieved something on No Child Left Behind, education, accountability. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is around the margins, and he realizes that, and you can tell from his most recent State of the Union address that he has resorted to playing small ball because that's all that's left, and that sometimes uh, when you're 23 or 24 percent in the polls for job approval, you have to start showing the public that you care about their everyday concerns. So hence, we're heading into a recession, and he's talking about uh, giving rebate checks back you know, or talking about your everyday concerns about your home mortgage, um, and he's finding that he has a bigger affinity for those small concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also in the State of the Union, he mentioned the executive order that he was about to issue on earmarks. On which, earmarks, which was a which was a good um, example of what you're left with in the last yeah, year. Yeah, that was like a donut, acting. you know, like zero calories, that particular yeah. initiative, the earmarking. <laughs> and, yeah, the executive order to get rid of earmarking is, um, and, and using that as a centerpiece of what he was promoting to the press corps about what was new and different about how he was starting out the year, that was a message that was supposed to be for the Republican base. Uh, but it was laughable because it was not an initiative that he had actually pursued as president through all of his other budgeting. And, you know, here we are in the last year, and it isn't going to have very little effect other than being kind of a billboard for uh, his party going into yeah. uh, a kind of opposition partisanship. Because it doesn't take place until the fiscal oh It's never going to take budget. place, yeah. it actually. It, right. it wouldn't take place until he's gone, and it won't actually have a big impact. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go to questions. Yep. Was President Was President Bush more transparent when his popularity was higher between uh, September 11th and when the Iraq War began to really deteriorate? Uh, was it different then for reporters, or has it always been this consistent, almost like you said, aggressive uh, perspective towards the press? You know, that's a really good question. My uh, experience was that the president was somewhat more accessible. Uh, and why, what I mean by accessible is that when a president comes into office, he or she always has some form of a honeymoon. In President Bush's case, he was concerned that he wasn't going to really have a very long honeymoon because of the recount situation and the, the very... Um, a debilitating sense that he had um, won the vote of the Supreme Court, but he had not won the popular vote of the people to come into the presidency. And so he uh, made himself somewhat more accessible and tried to, to present himself as a, as a very uh, 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 working across the aisle kind of uh, president with a uh, more approachable attitude towards his communication strategy. But what happened, his own personal view of the media, though, was very much that we should be <coughs> used and somewhat abused for his purposes as opposed to um, uh, being indulged, that, that he should tell his story and not the story we wanted to tell. 9-11 changed all that because of his feeling that the enemies were among us, that uh, we and the media were... Um, uh, making information available in a way that could undermine the very safety of the American people. And his fear, his, his true, truly his fear about what was happening in the United States, you cannot underestimate how fearful they were in the White House about what was coming next and, and how uh, concerned they were that things were um, uncontrollable on their, uh, uh, from their point of view. So, um, he very quickly shifted to a, a much more closed, less transparent form of governance. And, in fact, we in the press corps uh, experienced threats from the president's first press secretary, Ari Fleischer, who uh, had been with the president during his campaign and was very quick to tell us that certain things were noticed in the building, that we needed to be careful about what we said, 
that there was a certain kind of patriotic fervor that was sweeping the country and that we in the press corps and the mainstream media either got with the program or the public was going to turn against us. And to some extent, they were effective at that. That had a chilling effect on the media for a certain short duration of time. And I, I'm, I'm the first to admit that it was there for a short amount of time, but it did not last long. And I can um, remember pretty swiftly that we were there in the bre press briefing room talking about why didn't you connect the dots. And I can remember the harsh questions that were put to the President's first national security advisor, Condi Rice, about what would she say to the victims of 9-11, about their failure to protect people. I mean, there were some pretty harsh questions, and they persisted. Uh, but right in the beginning, the President had a, a particular point of view trying to get his legislative agenda through. You might uh, uh, not remember that the, the President went to agonizing, look back at the stories about this and you will be surprised that the President went to agonizing great effort to show transparency about how he came up with his decision about stem cells in the summer leading into 9-11. And they uh, went to great, great effort to show us how thoughtful he was, how he had pulled all kinds of scientific experts in, why he decided to kind of uh, hit a middle ground decision about uh, leaving certain lines of stem cells open for federal research and where federal funding should go. And you would have thought that that was the most monumental thing that a president had ever done as the decider. He wanted to, us to see this. His counselor, Karen Hughes, his communications counselor, showed us these briefing books about how he had uh, noodled over this decision. And then after that, we never saw another briefing book or figured out anything about who was called in to advise them or anything. It changed yeah. w quite rapidly uh -huh. after 9-11. Yeah, that's true. And they've not gone back to and that. And they have not gone back to that any uh, really yeah. very much. And to the point now that there are so few people who really care about the decision-making that went into, you know, uh, how he decided to tackle, you know, Pell Grants for kids or whatever. There's just very few people who are that intrigued with the process of the decision making. Um, the most, uh, I would say, the most detailed kinds of questioning he's engaged in recently on domestic policy is how did he decide how to put together uh, his version of a stimulus package? And they have gone to some lengths to try to say that they did a lot of outreach to economists and experts about whether we were in recession or not, but. That has been relatively recent and pretty, uh, I would say, very scant. But he has a very um, trusted Treasury Secretary right now in Mr. Paulson, and Mr. Paulson came from Wall Street. And to that extent, they've tried to utilize their policy expert a little bit more effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, than they have before. Than they have before, yeah. right. They have someone who can actually talk about why something makes sense from a policy point of view. And so they've tried to use that a little bit more effectively on Capitol Hill and certainly in talking to the business community and talking to Wall Street. Uh-huh. And even in the press briefing room, because they've brought and him in right, more than the once. press briefing room, exactly. Yeah. A member of the cabinet. But that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, another question? Um, we've been presented with two different models, like the Clinton model for uh, handling the press, which is like kind of relaxed, hectic, and certainly more entertaining. And which model of it, a tightly controlled message? Yeah. Um, which model would you say is more effective at actually carrying out the office and getting policy, like, done? Well, I'm going to vote with my own uh, constituency. <laughs> I'm going to vote for open transparency. <coughs> and uh, I, I enjoy presidents who love to gab. I really like, uh, I liked covering President Clinton for that reason. I found him not only interesting, of course, uh, from a media point of view, because he could certainly generate stories. Uh, a mile a minute. Uh, but I also enjoyed, truly, truly enjoyed the idea that President Clinton's administration, for all their faults, and they had many, they actually thought that uh, government was sort of of the people and by the people, and that they enjoyed government, and they enjoyed policy making. And President Clinton had a very different view about how he could entrust his circle of advisors and his cabinet to not only conceive of the policy, to uh, 
promote it legislatively, to sell it to the public, but also to be accountable for it in terms of its effectiveness and how it was working and how it was operating. And he allowed them to kind of own their turf and be responsible for it. And I found that that kind of organization had its faults, no question about it, but it also had the value of having many more people engaged and whether something was working or not, or whether you could modify something or amend it or change it as things were going on. Now, people have said, criticized President Clinton's administration for being one of the more partisans because he uh, was accused of being very uh, acutely aware of polling and how uh, the constituency groups in the uh, in the electorate in the United States were responding to certain policies that he put together. But to some extent, I thought that that level of accountability um, worked for him and uh, worked certainly worked for him during peacetime, I mean, obviously in prosperity, but prosperity also that he helped create, I mean, because he was navigating the country out of an economic downturn and trying to uh, create better times and try to make good on his campaign promise that it was the economy stupid and he was going to fix the economy or help work with the Federal Reserve to fix the economy. So I felt that not only was that a great administration to cover uh, for the media, but I thought it was actually kind of effective in terms of what he was able to do with Congress. Congress, when it uh, beat him up after the failure of health care and Democrats lost seats and Republicans gained the majority, that was part of his undoing legislatively, but it was also part of his um, triumphing again because he was able to uh, appeal to the public through the media in some ways that made Republicans, even though they were in the majority, fearful of him. And divided government turned out to be one of President Clinton's best days, not one of his worst. Even his dad was more accessible and more open and more transparent and had a much more um, evolved sense of kind of uh, what executive departments and agencies and the government was for and could do than uh, uh, Bush 43. And it will be fascinating to see whether we get a Republican or, or a Democratic president the next go round. I really think that either one will have to retreat a little bit from President Bush's um, uh, chokehold over communications and access. Although I certainly have had uh, friends and, and former sources in the Clinton administration, President Bill Clinton's administration, who have said they envied President Bush's ability to, to uh, kind of be disciplined and dictate a message, and that they would love to try to emulate some more of that. If Hillary Clinton comes in, I think she would try to be more like Bush in that way of trying to be more disciplined than her husband's administration was. Mm -hmm. But you could be disciplined, but um, but still provide information. But, but you can still provide like doing briefings, right. which this administration. I think it has not. to be a trade. To me, I think um, President Clinton was uh, more fun to cover because he put some money in the bank, and then he could draw that out. In other words, he gave to the media a little bit of what we thought was um, was helpful and interesting and important, and then he was able to sort of call that out of the bank when he needed it during impeachment. Uh huh. Okay. Um, another question? Um, you discussed the evolution of the number of different ways people get news. Are there some news sources that are better than others, or do they all have good and bad points? The news sources being everything from uh, news magazines to newspapers, blogs, just anything at all that you can think of. Well, I am a, um, a big advocate for transmission of news in lots of different formats. But I am not a big fan of news that is not actually gathered and vetted in a way that it is that there is some kind of safety mechanism for the consumer of that information, that there aren't vested interests, that it isn't biased, that it isn't false. I mean, that somehow there's been some back checking and monitoring of it. So in that sense, I don't care whether it's the New York Times in print or, uh, you know, Huffington Post blogging, as long as there's some level of actual news gathering, news checking, news editing that is sort of faithful to the idea of what we're trying to do here with um, 
free and open dissemination of information to the public for their use in understanding what's happening in their community, their society, their governance, or whatever. So I'm not a big fan of people sitting around in their pajamas and blogging their opinions uh, as if that's news, but I'm the first to say that bloggers are a really good check on what we're doing. Like, for instance, when, the, um, when Dan Rather ran into trouble uh, with the 60 Minutes reporting about the National Guard records, um, what happened in the blogosphere was a very successful and interesting check on what mainstream media were doing with maybe a bias, not maybe, but probably a bias or um, a lack of, of due diligence in checking what they were broadcasting and airing. So I'm, I'm all for that. I think that because we're looking over the president's shoulder, I think it's great that there are other venues and outlets that are looking over our shoulder in the news media. But um, I think that there needs to be a balance. So people ask me all the time, what should I read or where should I go for my news? And it's a very frustrating question because I just can't emphasize how wealthy I think everyone is in being able to layer on a lot of different news sources to have a multiplicity of uh, sophisticated information. Where I think people are struggling is that they're saying, I don't have enough time to do that. I want to just go to one aggregator that gives me what I need or what I should have. And I just don't think that that is possible. I just don't think that there is ever going to be now in our technological wealth and all this, uh, the, the ability of the Internet to transmit information or you f to get information in, you know, in all different forms and venues, newsletters, whatever it is, faxes, whatever. But I think uh, one of the interesting trends to watch is I'm fasting with the idea that as much as uh, blogging was supposed to be news, unvarnished and unchecked and sort of free and open, that the level of interference with that, with false information or biased information or even um, sophisticated companies hijacking bloggers to promote information for money. In other words, the sort of corruption of what it's supposed to be is shifting the Internet and the blogosphere back to a level of kind of uh, sophisticated checking and trying to get sort of good housekeeping seals of approval for what they're doing so that all of us as consumers of information have more faith in what we're getting because it's, it is being corrupted. Does that help? Oh, yeah. Another question? Let's, yeah. Another question? Yes. We're kind of speaking to a bias uh, in the media. Do you find it hard to put aside your own feelings uh, and political beliefs when you're just uh, talking to uh, White House operatives as far as uh, some policies they may be pushing? If, like, if you ever walked out of a room and said, this guy's a moron, I don't want to interview him anymore. Uh, how do you put aside how you feel about politics? Well, um, I have found very few occasions where I really knew that I was um, substantially to my core struggling with something and should not even be allowed to write about it because my opinion was so strong about that. That, that has happened very few times. But, um, but what I do find that you get, in, especially in Washington, as you've been doing reporting for a, a period of time, is that you have, you do have a reservoir of knowledge, or you think you do, of experience, and kind of what works and what doesn't work. And so the bias can be, almost can't come out as cynicism, <coughs> like you're never going to get Congress to do that, or... Um, for instance, when Bill Clinton came in and said, I'm going to put my wife in charge of health care, my bias was that was not going to work. And the bias kind of came out in some of our questions in the briefing room, as I recall it, because our bias was that Washington was going to turn against that culturally, was not going to be in favor of that. I mean, I didn't even know that um, Hillary Clinton was going to form, you know, these task forces with Ira Magazine or that went on, you know, into a circle of hell that was going to be the undoing of what they were actually trying to accomplish. I just thought that, politically speaking, it was going to be trouble. And so sometimes 
I find that my the trouble that I have is um, is a skepticism, a bias, or whatever. But actually, what I try to do is use that to test, you know, to try to come up with the right questions. And that's really the struggle: is am I thinking of all the right questions? Another where an area where I have encountered problems is President Bush is a president of great and abiding religious faith, and he wanted to bring that into the White House. And, um, and he had a great deal of support among Republicans for doing that and a great deal of skepticism among some others about what that would actually mean. And I, I know I challenge myself. Uh, to be more open to the idea of what were the upsides and the downsides of doing that and what could be accomplished by doing that. And uh, as we can see, we're a country that's still debating in our politics about where faith or religion should come in and wh whether it's um, any of the candidates uh, that are leading right now, we're going to see that still debated in the next president who succeeds President Bush. Do they want to get rid of the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives in the White House? Is there a role for religion in governance? What role is the appropriate role? Um, and you know, and that and that is there is an appropriate debate. I had no idea that in 9/11 would come and we would be debating um, Islam or, or or what's the best way for a president to approach other world religions in a geopolitical way. Um, all of that's been very fascinating to me um, as a reporter. It's challenged me as a reporter. So those are two examples uh, that come to my mind of how you can have expectations that border on cynicism or bias. Um, now, of course, uh, Ari Fleischer, President Bush's first press secretary, uh, wrote a book, not very good book, but a book that um, as, as submits that our bias he believes is for conflict, that we're not really biased uh, necessarily always from a political perspective, but that we're biased in the mainstream media towards conflict, that we like simple kind of stories that begin with a good guy and a bad guy or a this side and a that side, and that we like a clash and that, and that we will try to make up a clash just to actually get uh, a story that will get us onto the front pages or that will lead a story because it's kind of a cheap way to tell a story. And I think he's partially right about that. I think that we've devolved into a less sophisticated kind of quick hit sort of journalism that sometimes looks for that. You know, where is a candidate being hypocritical? Where is a president being hypocritical? D did he promise things that he can't deliver? And should we punish them for that? Um, that kind of thing. And we see it. And we see it right now between Romney and McCain. Absolutely. Uh, you have a lot of questions that uh, that news organizations right. are asking about that because right. they like that that battle because that battle's right out in public. And and I think we as a, a public, but especially in the media, we should give our political officials more credit for evolving in their thinking. I mean, why should a young politician coming into office? be holding the exact same opinion and position um, through 20 or 30 years of government service. Why should we be beating them up for maybe changing their position unless it looks, you know, crass and overtly like you're trying to just suck up to a particular side. But we don't reward politicians enough for evolved thinking. Um, somehow we've attached uh, in our minds in the media that to being a hypocrite. and. Um, and I wish we we were a little offered more nuance uh, when we look at our uh, political figures as well as our leaders. Okay, another question. This will be our last question. Yeah. Um, this is kind of switching gears a little bit, but I read that you covered the Supreme Court for a period of time. Uh huh. Um, I was just wondering if you might disagree or agree with this, but it seems as if there's a lack of coverage. Of the Supreme Court, especially considering um, its significance that it has on the public in terms of policy making, which can be argued. I was just wondering if you can speak to coverage of the Supreme well, Court. A, that is a really good question, and that's a particularly good question, too, because um, for the remainder of this presidency and into the next presidency, uh, the choices that uh, could potentially be made to to pick successors will change our country probably more f substantially than almost anything else because of the uh, 
of the split, the, the uh, ideological split that currently exists in the Supreme Court and the age of the current justices. But I, I would argue that there is um, quite a bit of sophisticated coverage of the Supreme Court. And you can certainly find it, but you have to look for it, and you have to want to be an astute consumer of it. So the mainstream uh, dailies, the Post, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Baltimore Sun, um, have very, very good, very um, sophisticated, well-trained, and experienced Supreme Court uh, correspondents. Um, the networks also have some very good people who understand the Supreme Court. They have a lot more experience and understanding than probably they get to put together in a very short hit story for a nightly newscast. But they have a very um, depth of field kind of understanding. And then there are specialty news organizations that you can certainly access online, whether it's um, the specialty legal publications, uh, or even there are some really good uh, online sites where legal experts debate what's going on in the Supreme Court or what's happened with certain decisions um, that, are, that are really uh, interesting to read, especially on particular topics because the Internet has allowed there to be specialization in certain uh, fields that are uh, coming up more often before the Supreme Court, like national security um, decisions that they've made um, during wartime. Very interesting discussions. Uh, so I find actually that it's easier and, and uh, maybe more uh, accessible to get in-depth coverage of the Supreme Court. The one thing that worries me is that there's, there are fewer and fewer resources among some of these news organizations to keep a deep bench uh, covering the Supreme Court uh, to the level that they have as we see more and more uh, newspapers falling away, you know, big, big bureaus are now shrinking to very small bureaus. And so they'll uh, do away with the Supreme Court or court watcher, and they'll take the wires instead. And so we'll get fewer interpretations of what's going on. But I don't think we're losing out on being able to see what's going on in the court. And if you guys get a chance, uh, please, please, please take advantage of the opportunity to go into the public gallery and watch the Supreme Court at some point in your academic careers because all it takes is a car and a little advanced planning and maybe getting up earlier than you normally do to wait in line to get into the public gallery to watch a case being argued. But um, there is nothing like it, don't you think? Yeah, it's just It's great. just absolutely terrific. Yeah. And, um, and the cases that they're deliberating on now uh, really run the gamut and are so interesting. So... If you do get a chance or you can plan ahead, go online to the Supreme Court website, figure out what the schedule is, get in a car, get here early in the morning, you know, 7, 7.30 in the morning, stand in line, and it is fascinating. Yeah. Are, is anybody here thinking about law school? All yeah. right. <laughs> well, please take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah. You're so close. You, you know, you're just 45, 50, 60 minutes away. Um, Please do it if you haven't already done it, because it's really a shame not to, to take advantage of it if you get a chance, because you're so close. Thank you very much, Alexis. Thank you very much for your great, great questions, and you have a wonderful discussion. <laughs> have a good rest of your week, and uh, how many people are going to watch Super Tuesday Returns? tonight. <laughs> Fascinating. You guys are living in, you know, experiencing a really, really interesting time. How many people are um, uh, are actually Obama fans? How many Clinton fans? How many McCain fans? Romney fans? Huckabee? Anybody else know who I leave out? Ron Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, thank you very, very much.